beat against the house and it fell with a great crash. I don't know about you, but I want to be the person that built my house in a rock. And I feel like sometimes it is difficult because we think of what we want for our life or we think about our plans and things that we can picture in our minds and we think, oh, that sounds great. But if we don't consult God and we don't involve him in those conversations and we're not asking him for guidance and we're not asking him what he wants for our lives, all we're doing is building our house in the sand because we don't know what he wants for us. So just, it hit me because I'm like, I want to be that person that builds a house in a rock. I want to know that whatever's going on in my life and whatever situation that I'm going through, that I'm asking God, what do you want? I know what I want, but what do you want? I know that his plans are greater for me and his plans are the best plans that I, that I won't even be able to comprehend. And if I do that, nothing, nothing can stand against me, nothing can stand against you because he's got you and he's not going to let you fall. So we're going to sing this next song. We're just going to pray. Dear God, I just thank you for everything that you've done in our lives. We are insanely grateful for just the blessings that you've provided us, Lord, and just just for the love that we don't deserve, Lord. And I pray that we would just continue to rely on you. We would continue to consult you, Lord, and we would continue to be those people that strive to build our house on the rock, Lord, that you are the firm foundation that we stand on, God. Not our own, but yours. Knowing that in you, all things are possible, and in you we will not fail, Lord, because you will not fail us. In your name we pray.
I just want to be and I just want to be where you are want to sing it out and I just there is nothing like your love there is nothing like your love no no Jesus sing it again I just want to be where and I just Of your amazing 
church singing out. There is nothing like your love. This is your cry this morning. Jesus, there is nothing like your love. Come on, sing, I can't. Yeah, I can't get enough.
Jesus, there is nothing like you. Come on, you sing this with me. I've never known a love like this before. I've never felt a touch like this before. I've never known a love like this before. What can I do but fall in love with you? I've never known a love like this before. I've never felt a touch like this before. their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. 
Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak to your word with great boldness. Stress, stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Let us pray. Dear God, listening to these verses only make me think of this world that we live in, with how it is unstable and in constant battle with our countries, our political attacks, and most of all, all the violence in our streets and in our homes. We pray especially for, for the police officer that died in the line of duty just recently, Andres Vasquez Lasso, and the children that had to take cover that were playing on school grounds just as this was occurring. I can't imagine these small children having to endure seeing this occur right in front of them and having to try to continue to be kids just if this was never happening. This is just one example of the daily struggles we are constantly seeing. Just as Peter and John observed the changes that were happening and asked for protection, prayer, and to be bolder, we ask the same, dear Lord, please watch over us and fill us with the Holy Spirit. Speak to us so we may be bolder in your ways and bolder to share your word and love. In your name, amen. Take a deep breath, because I know that was uh, pretty hard to take, thinking about that just happened. Um, but anyways, okay, switching. Good afternoon, everyone. Buenas tardes a todos. My name is Mindy Blanco. We would like to first welcome anyone that is new here. So thank you so much for coming to our service today, and we hope it's not the last time we see you. For everyone else, happy Family Sunday. Yay. Before we take our seats, please give a big hug or a nice smile to someone that you haven't seen for a while or maybe a new face. Anyone online, hello. Adrian, we, we hope you feel better. And Mamita, if you're there, happy belated birthday, honey. Mommy loves you. For all our new brothers and sisters that joined us today, we would like to provide a welcome goodie bag. So please fill out the welcome card that are in the pews in front of you so we can connect with you. It looks like this. Yes? Yes. <laughs> you can hand it over to the ushers after service. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, some announcements. Tomorrow is worship and prayer night. Yeah, at 730 to 830. Let's definitely make an effort to attend tomorrow, okay? All right. It's really important for our growth together. Okay, so guess what? Besides the fact that I have a sty and it's bothering so much, um, it's daylight savings time next weekend. So I don't know if that's good because I know we lose an hour of sleep, if I'm not mistaken, right? Spring forward, yeah. So that's, I guess, the negative, but the positive, of course, is that spring is coming, so yay. Um, okay, so what else, what else? Okay, offering. So lastly, if you are tithing, just a reminder, you can do so through the New Life app, select Norwich. Um, you can set up recurring or one-time method, or if you prefer to write a, out a check, please do so, and please don't forget to write on the memo, Norwich, and hand it over to one of our ushers um, after service, or there's a kiosk in front, and it looks like this. Thank you so much. All right, let us pray. Please bow your heads. Dear Lord, may we give as generous as possible so that we can bestow through you your good works and what you want us to accomplish with those generous offerings. Bless those, dear Lord, who need you financially, physically, and spiritually. And may we together in this church show up for one another. We thank you for your bounty gifts, dear Lord. In your name, amen.
Hey, New Life Church family, this is Pastor Juan Sanchez from New Life Cicero, and I'm here to give you the 2023 March update. Did you know that just a couple of weeks ago, we gathered over 250 ministry leaders and volunteers for our annual Engage Summit? This year, the theme was Serve. We were reminded that serving begins, continues, and ends with Jesus. Hey, would you just help me right now to thank those who attended, all of our volunteers at all of our locations churchwide. Thank you so much for everything you do. You make our church something special. Hey, this is March. So ladies, you know what time it is. It's time for our annual Women's Encounter Retreat. The retreat is happening this year on March 31st and April 1st at the Moody Bible Institute in downtown Chicago. And ladies, you want to register because this event, it will sell out. This is an annual retreat where women come to experience the power of God, do something amazing in their life. You don't want to miss this retreat. And finally, church, let me remind you that we are just weeks away on April 9th for Easter Sunday. This is it, the greatest Sunday on our calendar. We want to encourage you to invite someone out. We are in this series right now entitled Finding Jesus. What a great time to invite someone to a church service and hear a timely message on who Jesus is. Help us spread the good news of the gospel this Easter season. Well, hey, New Life Church family, thank you so much for listening for this update. Hope you have a great Sunday. God bless you, and we'll see you soon. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. I think it's afternoon, right? It's afternoon. All right, let's open up our Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter 3. Man, you know what? I got to say something. I, um, I... Man, I love our worship uh, team, man. I tell you, they're, they're the most beautiful gr group I have ever seen. Um, every one of them, they do such a great job. They, they really, um, I don't even want to use the word pride themselves. It's not. It's not. They just want to bring Jesus something that's, man, that's worthy of them. You know what I mean? And, uh, and I just think to myself, the reason I know that is because uh, man, I always sense his pleasure. I get it. I, I get it. I see it. Every, I feel it every Sunday. And it's not about feeling. But let's be honest, man. It is a little bit about feeling, isn't it? It should be about feeling. If Jesus is real, I should feel him, right? You know? So, all right, man, I'm so excited, so excited. Let's open up our Bibles to John, uh, not John, Genesis chapter 3. And we're going to read a little bit, but before we do that, we have to pray. Father God, I'm so grateful, grateful for everything. Um, Lord God, I'm grateful for the fact that uh, you have given us um, ears to hear worship. Lord, I, I think to myself what it said, what you said through the, uh, through the, uh, the Apostle Paul in, in 2 uh, Corinthians. It said that to this very day that when the law is read, that there are those who hear it and they have a veil over their eyes. They can't come into the presence of God. They see it only or hear it only in a way that it brings death to them. And I'm like, man, why, why have you been so good to us? And I don't, I don't have that answer. I don't know. I don't know why you're good to us. But I do know that you are good to us. And I want to ask you, Lord God, I know that there's people in here. I think to myself, there's a lot of youth in this place. They hear the message every week. And you know what? They're still looking at the world and going, man, the world looks real appetizing. They don't know. I think that there's a lot of people who are beaten down in this place. And uh, they're like, man, I just want a little refreshment. Can I ask you to do that? Can I ask you to give a little bit of refreshment to those who are brokenhearted, those who are depressed and saddened? Can I ask you, Lord God, to shine yourself so brightly that even the eyes that don't want to see you can't help but see you? That's what we pray, Lord God, with one voice, one heart, in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. All right, let's uh, start at verse 1 in chapter 3 of Genesis. This is the fall of man. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any of the trees in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the fruit of the tree of the garden. But God did say you must not eat from the fruit in the tree that is in the center of the garden. Or you must not touch it because if you do, you will die. 
The, ser the, sa the serpent said to the woman, surely you will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some, ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were opened. They realized that they were naked. Huh. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord in the garden as he was walking through the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord from among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who is it that told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And the man said, it's the woman. It's the woman you gave me. She gave me some fruit to eat and I ate it. Then the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, well, it wasn't me. It was the serpent. He deceived me. I ate it. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and because of above all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He will crush your head, but you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain, you will give birth. Your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree from which I commanded you, you must not eat. Cursed now is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all of the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your brow. You will eat by your food until the ground, uh, until you return to the ground from which you came for you are dust, and from dust you will return. This is God's word. Um, one of the things that uh, we're doing this whole series is Kent was really good, and he did such a great job, didn't he? He did a great job. He told us that the, that, that, that the story of the gospel is given to us over and over and over and over. It's not just one isolated incident. Jesus isn't plan B. He's not like, well, what do we do now? Uh, he, he's not an emergency plan. Literally, the whole Bible is about us seeing him, his story. And what we also see is there's a tendency within human beings, within all of us, even in the Christian church, to put ourselves in the Bible. We'll do it. We'll have a tendency to do it. But it's always been about him. I thought to myself this week, the reason that we study the Bible, and I hate that word study. You know why? Because God is not a subject. He's not mathematics. He's not history. He's a person. But I thought to myself, study is actually a good word because God uses the word study to talk to husbands about their wives through Peter. Remember, he says, study your wives to know them so that you may know how to love them. The word study that he wants for us when we're looking at the Bible is the same way that we would look at Christ. We would see his glory and we would say to ourselves, how can I truly love this wonderful Savior better? That's the way we're supposed to study the scripture. We're actually supposed to treasure it. One of the overarching and overshadowing aspects of God's character and personality is that he's holy. One thing I know about holiness is that it's very difficult for us to define. You know why? It makes no sense. There's nothing for us to look at and go, wow, that's holy. Because the word literally means other. So there's everything and then there's God. So you can't look at this, or you can't look at that, or you can't look at this, or you can't look at that, and say, wow, that makes sense. Now I understand holy. Holiness can only be given when God turns on the light. So you can't seek him. He must turn on the light before you can even see him. Remember Nicodemus? Nicodemus came to him at night. Yes, that was literal, but it was also figurative. He thought Jesus was a good teacher. And Jesus is like, hold on, stop right there. We could go no further because if you think I'm just another teacher, you really don't know who I am. The Holy Spirit hasn't opened up your eyes. 
God's holiness is what we see in his glory. You know, one of the things that I thought about today when we were worshiping is like when Pope, uh, Jack talked about Jesus in front of Pilate or, or, or in front of the Pharisees, and he's like, if every tongue were stilled, if every tongue were stilled, the rocks and the stones themselves would sing out my praise. And I thought to myself, man, there's a, a lyric in a song that really made sense to me at that moment, and it said this, that the glory of God cannot be unseen. Once God opens up your eyes to see his glory in all of its fullness, you can never deny it. And you know what? I've seen it. I remember the moment that I saw it. I remember when he opened up my eyes. And ever since then, there's been other things that have tried to catch my attention. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. You need me. You need me. You need me. And sometimes, because I am who I am, I have a tendency to go, oh, yeah, I, I really need you. And then even if I grab it in my hands... The reality of who he is, the glory of what he's shown me, I go, this really doesn't make any sense anymore. I can't have this and have you. You understand what I mean? So we long to see the glory of God. You know what? That's what we were made to see. And we see the glory of God in the story of Jesus Christ being told over and over and over and over. God's holiness means that he is perfectly and completely different. This is why we as his children are not allowed to have any relationship or loyalty even on the same ground as him. Not even my wife, not even my children you know why? They can't bear the weight. He's protecting them. He's protecting us. When I'm disillusioned with my husband, it's because I want him to be my God. And he's like, what do you want from me, woman? And she goes, I don't know. But what she really wants, she wants for him to be her savior. And men could do it too. Men could do it too. Every character attribute that God has is governed by his holiness. His personality is ruled by holiness. Judgment, God's holiness means that he is perfectly and completely different. That's why we as children are not allowed to have any relationship or loyalty that's even on the same ground as him. Listen, I wanted you to understand this. The aim of every Christian, the aim of every Christian life is to strive. And I use that word all the time. Why do I use that word? Anybody who's been here knows for a while. Because you're going to try to get it. You're going to strive. I literally see it as a word picture. It's like you strive, you reach, you bend, you, you kind of stretch yourself. You use effort to get it. You never can have it fully. We strive. Strive to do what? We strive to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and all of our strength and all the things that we have within us. Why? Because we've seen him. And when we see him, we think to ourselves, this is the only thing that makes sense. This is the only thing that makes sense. God is unlike anyone or anything else. Paul sees the holiness of God most clearly in the person of Jesus Christ. He's not just a message. He is the message. And when he sees Jesus in his fullness, you know what he says? Go with me to Romans chapter 11. If you have your Bibles, open it up to Romans chapter 11, one of my favorite verses in all of the Bible. And it tells me how to live the Christian life. It says this, all the depths and the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments. His paths, they go beyond tracing out who has ever known the mind of the Lord, who has ever been his counselor, who has ever given to God that God should repay him. For as I look at him, he's saying, it's from him, it's through him, and it's to him are all things. It's to him be the glory forever. You know why he's saying that? Because as he sees Jesus fully lifted up, he realizes that he at one time, as religious as he was, was living for himself. And you know what he says as a result of this? He says, therefore, whenever you read that in the Bible, it's because God has pulled something amazing out and shown it to you. And when you see the amazing thing, when you see the glory of God, you go, well, therefore... And this is what the therefore is. I urge you, family of God, in full view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices to him, holy and pleasing, for this is your reasonable act of worship. See it? That's how it works. 
when you see the glory of God, it pulls out of you everything that should be. God is unlike anything or anyone else. No one is comparable to him. Jesus was beyond tracing out. As you read the Gospels, you could see nobody could understand him. He was speaking plainly, but Jesus was literally an enigma right in their presence. I, I heard this in a sermon a couple weeks ago. I had to email it to myself. Jesus was tenderhearted, but he was never weak. He was completely bold, but he was never harsh. You know, sometimes when I have to say on di difficult things or very hard truths, I say it in a very harsh way. You know where we learned that from? The original Jack Fitzmaurice, my father. My father used to say hard things, but he used to say it like a blunt sword. And he'd come up and he'd go, man, let me tell you the truth. Wah! And you know what would happen? It would crush you. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? And you know what? Jesus was bold like that. He, he never wavered. But he didn't take the truth like a broadsword and wants to cut you in half with it. He wants to use it like a scalpel. And he wants to take out the tumors with it. He wants to heal you. He doesn't want to destroy you. Jesus is like un unlike anyone else. He was always humble, but he was never uncertain, nor was he timid. He was a person of unbending conviction. You know what that means? He never ever wavered on who he was and what he had come to do. He knew his significance, he knew his value, he knew his identity, he knew his purpose, and he knew his mission. And he never wavered. Have you ever been around people like that? Yeah, you know what I've learned about people like that? They're very hard to approach. You know, my father was the, and, and I, I tell you the truth, he was a lovely man. I loved him so much. He was a man of moral conviction. His father left his family when he was 13 years old, had to go work on the back of a, a beer truck to, to, to pr provide for the family. And man, we were told this story all over. From 13 years old, he took care of his family. And we had this like icon in our own house to live up to. And you know what I realized every time I walked out of the house? I was a scoundrel because I used to love to get high and get drunk. So I could never live up to this standard. So you know what? I could never go to my dad with my weaknesses. You know why? Because when you're a person of conviction like that, you have to pretend you're something else. Does that make sense to you? It makes sense. But Jesus was completely approachable. That means you could go to him as a leper and go, hey, look at me. Will you please cleanse me? Because if you don't, I'm without hope. Jesus demonstrated ultimate power, but he was perfectly sensitive. Remember, he was the one that went up to Mary Magdalene. She was demonically possessed by seven demons. Everyone threw stones at her. Get away from me, you crazy old hag. And what did he do? I want to free you. And you know what happened? Once he did free her, she and three other women were the only ones to come to the tomb in the morning. <laughs> That's what happens when you see the glory of God. He was someone who was fully, with full integrity, but he was never rigid. He was always mindful that you and I are made of dust. He will never waver on what is true. He will never waver on what is good, but he will always understand who you are. And you know what? One of the beauties is when you know him by grace, you can tell him who you are. I tell him all the time, do you know who I am, Lord? I am an idol worshiper. Apart from your grace, I can do nothing. Don't teach me anything, Lord. I was never smart that way. Empower me. I believe, I just don't believe enough. I tell him these prayers every day. He was a man full of passion, but he was never prejudiced. That means to me and you today, one of the things I want you to understand, that Jesus has always been the reason all things are. That's what the gospel is about. It's not just a simple message called the Romans Road. It's about one message, that everything is about him. It's about him. If Jesus were to stand before you and I today, walk into this room, do you know what he would say to us as he'd look us in the eye? You are because I am. The only reason you have air in your lungs or lungs to breathe it is because I gave them to you. I have a design. I have a claim on your life. Your life. You could deny me all you want, but if I chase you down, you'll never get away from me. 
Paul understood it. Listen to what he says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. He says, for he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. For he's the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning and the preeminent one from among the dead, so that in all things he might have supremacy. When you see the glory of God empowered by the Holy Spirit, you realize everything is about him. When you serve up here, it's about him. When you serve back there, it's about him. When you serve from behind this pulpit, it's about him. It's never about me. And when it's about him, strangely enough, everybody gets fed. Just like the fish and the bread. Remember? When those two little fish and those five little cakes of bread were given to Jesus, 15,000 were fed. That's what Jesus wants us to understand. Life is about him. It's created by him. It's created for him. It's created through him. And he's the one who sustains it and holds it all together. You know what this does on, on a regular basis in my life? It reminds me, I don't live for me. And neither do you. And if I do, and if you do, then you can expect at the end of your life that it will die right then and there. Life is about him. And it reminds me that everything I do now has a different shade. Every reason I go home, it's not for Tracy to meet my needs, which I want her desperately to do. And many in marriage want the same thing. No, no, no. I'm there so that God could transform me. I'm there to love an imperfect person just like Christ loves me who is imperfect. My children are never a burden. You know why? Because of the light of God's glory reminds me that I am to mirror image his perfect parenthood over me. I don't, he doesn't just love me when I take out the garbage. He doesn't just love me when I do the dishes. He doesn't love me when I do everything right. No, no, no. He loves me all the time, regardless of who I am. And that's what God wants from me. And he transforms me by that truth. He transforms me by that glory. And he transforms you the same way. I think to myself as I wrote this down, I thought about David. Remember David's life? He was bringing the Ark of the Covenant back up to Mount Moriah to the threshing floor of Azuniah, remember? And he brings it up the first time, and he invites all the wrong people. He invites all the, the, the big wigs. And God was like, I, I don't want this. And Uzzah touches the ark of God's presence, and he dies. Presence, and he dies, right? And then David is like, oh, man, I'm really heartbroken. I don't even know. I feel like I failed. And for two years, he leaves the ark where it's at. But then the Lord comes back to me and says, okay, put me in the place that you, you, you have set for me. And this time, he's bringing it up, and there's a huge procession. There's everybody there. And Jesus, uh, uh, David, I'm sorry, David gets to that place to where he realizes what's happening. Do you remember what he did? He started to strip off his clothes. Do you remember that? Do you ever ask yourself, why did he do that? I've heard pastors say all sorts of crazy things about why he was doing it. This was not a static worship. It wasn't. Please, keep your clothes on. What this was, was he saw the light of God's glory. And what happens when you come out of your house in the morning? After it's kind of dark, and it's like maybe 7 o'clock in the morning, what happens when you see that light? I did it just this Saturday. I stepped out on my porch, and the light was like bright, and I went, right? That's what happened. He saw the light of God's glory, and you know what he did? He went like this, and he saw that he was dressed like a king in the presence of a greater king. And you know what he said to himself? Wait a minute. This is wrong. I can't be dressed like a king in the presence of a greater king. So he stripped off his clothes so that the king of kings can get the focus point. That's the point of the scripture. That's the point of salvation. So that the king of kings can get the focus point. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about us meeting our goals. It's about him meeting his goals in us. And by that... He's glorified and we are benefited. That's the truth of the gospel. That's the truth of the gospel. We cannot be kings in the presence of the king of kings. That's why we study Jesus. You know why? To be overwhelmed by the idea that he is the focus point of my life. And I'm going to tell you why. Because if you don't think that, you will have a tendency to fill that vacancy. And so will I. I've done it a million times. 
only to be corrected by the grace that saved me. Existence is not about me. Because if Jesus isn't the reason for my existence, I will try to fill the vacancy. And you know what I've learned? I can't carry it. I cannot be the main purpose of my life. You can't either. That's why we study the person of Jesus Christ. Let's go back to the very beginning. Remember we read the words? What was the first words that were spoken into the universe? Let there be what? Let there be what? Let there be light. Well, did you ever ask yourself when you read this, what's the light he's talking about? Why don't you ever ask that question? You know why? Because we think it's a story. Well, it is a story, but it's a story about Jesus, and we're supposed to read it. You know why? Because we're supposed to see Jesus in it. And when we see Jesus in it, like I said, once you see the glory of Jesus Christ, you can't go back. Jesus said, let there be light. Well, I thought to myself, what light is he talking about? Because God had not created the stars and the sun until day four. So what light did God bring into the universe? Well, I have a wonderful commentary by two uh, professors of biblical exposition out of Dallas Theological Seminary. You know what they suggest? That when Jesus said, let there be light, what God did was turn on the lights of his glory. It's almost like this, this light switch right here. The light is always there, but no one knows it until the switch is turned on. When God said, let there be light... He turned on the visible manifestation of his glory. And like I said before, you and I were created for one thing, to hunger and to be fed by a vision of his glory. We were meant to see his glory. Remember what John, Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 12? I am the light of the world, and anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness. God had not created the stars or the sun until day four, so he brought his glory into existence. Not created, always existence, but now it was invisible. Why? Because when he turned on the light of his glory, Jesus, listen, he was letting you and I know a very, very valuable truth, that creation amounts to nothing, nothing, unless he decorates its existence. Remember what Jesus said? I tell you the truth, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Following Jesus is way more important than showing up on Sunday. And I'm going to tell you exactly what this implication means. It means this. Unless I, Jesus, illuminate your life, your existence has no direction, it has no clarity, it has no purpose, it has no eternal joy and no eternal beauty. I must ornament your life. That's why you were born. Boy, this goes beyond simply religiously following Jesus. We want to quickly interject ourselves into scriptures, but I believe that when we look at scriptures, we, would be, we should be looking at the creator in the, in the light of who he reveals himself to me. Do you know what I do? I fall deeply in love with him. Do you know why I fall deeply in love with Jesus? Because he loved me. I was not lovable. There was nothing lovable in me. See, it's easy for me to love people when they do what I want them to do. It's not easy to love them when they don't. It's not easy for me to love my enemies. You know what I'd love to do to my enemies? Choke them to death. You laugh because you do too. But God showed his love to me by demonstrating it in this while i was still actively at war against him his son died in my place his son became my sin so that i could be the righteousness of god i see it over and over and over and as i read scripture i fall more deeply in love with god and the more deeply i fall in love with god the more i have to say no to me because I can't be king in the presence of the greater king. And neither can you. Once we see him in the light of who he is and we fall in love for him, for who he truly is, 
we find our logical response. One of the worst things that I want for us as a congregation is for us to be prompted to do something. And when you live this witness out, someone goes, why are you doing that? And then you go, well, my, my pastor told me to do that. Who cares what your pastor told you to do? Nobody came here to listen to me. I'm interchangeable. The least and most important, most important person in this building. Anyone can do what I do. You'll want to hear it from him so that when you bear witness by living it out and someone says, why are you doing that? You go, because the Lord told me. And when you say that and you mean it and you know that the Lord has told you to do something or to live in its particular way, you know what happens? No one can convince you you're wrong. I've got evidence of it. Someone I work with was saying to me, man, you know, you're always doing this. You're always doing that. You're always giving away. You're always doing that. And he's like, man, how old are you, 56? I go, yeah, he goes, man, you're getting old, bro. You got to start living for yourself a little bit. You know what he told me? He goes, live for yourself. You've already raised your kids. And you know what? I wanted to hear it at that point. I was disillusioned and angry. I was tired. And you know what? Now, thinking back to it, man, I can't wait till I'm dead. You know why? Because that's when I'm really going to live. That's when I'm really going to live. Man, I'm telling you right now, you see the glory of God and you'll know it. When we see Jesus, we see him in the creating, the creating of an Eden, a paradise. I want you to tell you a little bit about the paradise that God gives and creates. There was no stress. There was no opposition. There was no hostility. There's no animosity. There's no insecurity. There's no fear. There's no lacking. There's no hunger. There's no tears. Can I ask you a question? What would your life be like if one of those things were gone? And they had it all. But the deceiver, he comes in and he suggests that God is not good. He suggests that God's a controller. He suggests that God's a manipulator. Don't you sometimes think that? He's actually trying to hold that. Uh, there's so much out there in the world for me to have. It looks so appealing. I fought it. I lived it. And I know now it was poison. He says he's controlling you. He's manipulating you. He's holding out on you. You know one of the things that Satan wants you to believe? That freedom can only f be found when you have to answer only to you. Isn't that what he tries to tell you? But you know what he never tells you? That if you turn yourself over to yourself, you have enslaved yourself to a tyrant who will never, ever have enough. You have followed someone who will lead you to a dead end street. Remember what John said, Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10? The thief, he came to kill, to steal, and destroy. But why have I come? So that you may have life, life to its fullest. This tells us two beautiful things as we see the gospel in creation. That mankind, when they believe a lie, can mess up even paradise. Do you think that they did not have grace? They had grace. And they believed a lie. And you know what they did? They screwed up paradise. But you know what it also tells me? Another beautiful thing. That grace, God's grace is greater than man's frailty or foolishness, and it's also greater than Satan's deceit. Look, Jesus is the one that seeks out the first couple. He's the one who goes and looks for them. He's the one who calls them out from hiding. He's the one who makes coverings for their nakedness and their shame. They don't look for him they don't run to him asking him to fix the problems. They run away from him. What do you do when you fail? What do you do? I know what I have a tendency to do. Isolate. Right? I alienate myself from God. There I am again. I failed again. You know what? Why try? Then from there, everything else happens. I start to alienate myself from my wife. I start to alienate myself from the people I work with. I start to alienate myself from my kids. I start to lose energy, deplete energy. My growth starts to dwindle. And then I think to myself, man, when is he going to finally cut the rope? Am I the only one in the room who thinks this? 
But what does he do? He seeks them out. Where are you? Where are you at, Adam? We're, we're over here. We, we, we're naked. We were afraid. Naked? Who told you we're naked? Did you eat what I told you not to eat? And what did he do when he saw them? He clothed them. He clothed them. Man, we see the gospel over and over and over and over. But because he is holy, he pronounces judgment. God's judgment, though, I want you to understand, is never without hope. You know what the best hope that you can get in this world? I'll tell you. It's called a wish. I'm going to have a barbecue on Sunday. I hope it doesn't rain. I'm going to get a good job. I hope I get good grades. I, 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 I'm thinking about having a party. I hope people can come. That's the best that this world can give you. So if that's where your hope is, then it's just a wish. But the hope that God gives us in Jesus Christ is a confidence. Do you know why? Because it's not based in what you can bring. It's based in what he said he would do. He says, trust me. Put your faith in me. When I say it, I mean it, and I can accomplish it. That's what he says. So he gives us judgment with hope. As God speaks a curse on the serpent, he lets the deceiver know that his time is now limited. He's telling Satan that how his story ends. He says to him, your offspring and the woman's offspring, they're going to be at war. And you're going to strike his heel, but he's going to ultimately crush your head. From that point on, the devil's fate is sealed. He knew his time was limited, and he had to throw all things to the wind to stop the Messiah from coming. And what does he do? Because he doesn't know where the Messiah is going to come from, he infiltrates the first family. He starts to whisper in Cain's ear, your brother's sacrifice is being offered, but you're being rejected. And what does Cain do? Takes his brother out in the field and bashes his skull in and then tries to hide the body. It was Satan who whispered in Pharaoh's ear, you better kill the firstborn. Because if you don't kill the firstborn, the deliverer is going to come out. And guess what? You can't be Pharaoh if they rise up. If they get their king, you need to protect yourself. Then he whispered in Haman's ear a few hundred years later, you better exterminate the Jews. Why did he say that? Why do you think that the Jews have been so picked on? Because he's been saying the same lie forever. You must get rid of the Jews because that's where the Savior of the world will be born. You can't be king if the king comes. He was the one that counseled Herod to dispatch the temple police. You better go out there and kill all the male children under the age of two. Or all that you've worked for will be for nothing because you'll be replaced once the king of heaven arrives. It's he who convinced the Pharisees and the chief priests to conspire against Jesus. And why did he do it? He whispered, it's for the good of the people you know what he was really saying you've worked hard to rule this world you've earned your spot don't give it up to him I want you to understand something the enemy has been selling that same lie for years he is constantly trying to insinuate the same thing to you and I it's you or him either you're the king or he's the king He's telling you this, that to go to him means you die. He's not lying. Jesus says, come to me so that you may die. But what he never says is this. Jesus says, it's only by dying that you can really live the way that I want you to live. Do you know why I think most people don't follow Jesus? Because it's easier to not follow him. It's hard. It's a narrow path. You know what that means? That I have to strip myself. I can't come with pride. I can't come with self-righteousness. I can't come with works. I can't come with me wanting to be his partner. I got to come naked. Uh, uh, uh. And you know what else I've learned? Surrender is rigorous. Can I get an amen? Because once I think I've given one thing up, another leaf pops open. It's relentless. And I gotta tell you another uncomfortable truth. If you're not 
rigorously trying to surrender, then there's a good chance you're not following Christ. When all of the opposition, all the opposition that I see that the enemy throws in the path of Jesus, listen to this, it only serves to accomplish God's will. Remember what the promise was? You're going to strike his heel, but he's going to crush your head. Listen to this. Remember, he puts Cain against Abel, ruins both of them. Cain can't be the Messiah. He murdered his brother. And Abel, he's dead. We don't got to worry about him. What does Abel become? We find on the book of Hebrews, he becomes a witness to the greater sacrifice. What about Moses? Get rid of Moses. If the Moses doesn't come, the deliverer doesn't come, then they stay slaves forever. Well, Moses did come. And out of that opposition from Pharaoh, Moses brought the law. And you know what the law does? It convinces you and me of our need to be saved. The law was never given to us so that we could prove how worthy we were. It's to see the glory of God in all of its splendor and realize, I need to be saved. Satan, every time he moved against Jesus, if I just do this, if I just do that, if I just stop this, if I just insinuate that, if I just get him to do this, then I can win. And every time he does it, he just does exactly what Jesus wants him to do. Herod's murderous insecurity and pride. You know what that does? It fulfills a prophecy about the Messiah in 3115. For a voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning. For Rachel weeps for her children. She refuses to be comforted because they were no more. And what about Caiaphas? Remember Caiaphas? Caiaphas was worried because he had a dream. And what was the dream? One man must die for the people of God to live. Do you know who delivered that message? Satan. Satan whispered that dream into his head. You know what Satan thought he was doing? If I can just get Caiaphas to conspire with Rome, I can kill the Messiah and I can rule on the earth forever. But you know what he did? He only served to accomplish what Jesus wanted him to do. Jesus, through Satan's attempt to downplay him, to run a coup over him, he opened up the door for Jesus to go onto his throne. And you know what his throne was? It wasn't a golden chair. It was a crown. It was a crown of thorns. And it was a, 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 a thorn. A throne of wood that he was nailed to. And you know what? By going on that cross, you know what he did for you? He purchased you back from slavery. He won your salvation. Now, you, no longer are you an orphan. You're a child of God because of what he's done. Satan, every time he thought he was going to win, if I could just get in there. You know what I think to myself as I read through the Bible? One of the, one of the, uh, the punishments of Satan is that he's allowed to act in a way where every time he moves against God, he thinks he's going to win. And every time he does it, he's like, I finally got him. And then he sees it crumble in his hands. You think that? I think that's fair. I think that's fair that he's, he's given this frustration over and over and over. So what does that mean for you and I? It's simple. That we need to look at this story over and over and over. You know why? Because this story deserves to be told time and time again. You know why? Because that's where I fall in love with him over and over and over. And when I fall in love with him, I find the reason for my life. Do you want the reason for your life? Or do you want the hope that the world can give you? You can have that. You can have everything the world wants. You're, you're a capable group. But just know this. In the end, when you breathe your last, whatever you have here stays here. But God has come so that you may have abundant life. So choose abundant life. What we're going to do right now is we're going to bring up our, our uh, baptism candidates
You know what we could do? We were all told to sit down, but I don't think this is a sit down moment. I think that we should stand up. I think that this is a time for us to celebrate. As the worship team comes forward, as the worship team starts to play, as we wait for Marco to come forward to give his testimony. <laughs> Hi, church. I'm Marco Flores. Um, I, was, I was living a very selfish life with many sins, addiction being at the top of one. I lost one family in the pet, uh, uh, and two kids. Lost many friends, family members. Um, through the time of God, saved my, my father and my mother as they became followers of God in hopes one day I would be also saved. I used my addiction, me and coping with anxiety like I wanted to change and I didn't know how. I don't know how where I would, I don't know where I would be without my Savior Jesus Christ. I stumbled, I stumbled, upon, the, I stumbled upon New Life Norwich, slowly started attending, but was truly not going for myself. I was doing it for my wife. I was doing it for the wrong reasons. I ended up hitting rock bottom to the point where I was about to lose my second family. I reached out to someone from church and asked for help. I had openly talked about myself, not truly surrendering, and that's when I started understanding and repenting for my sins. God guided me. I found God in this church and the many people who have grown to love me and my family. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Philippians 4.13 Baptist is a step of obedience, leap of faith, and the beginning of a walk with the Lord. I choose to be baptized today because I want to die in my old ways and be renewed in God's image. We were therefore buried with him through baptism and death in order that just as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Romans 6.4. You know what this tells me? That nothing could stop Christ. He didn't look for Christ. He came for his wife. And you know what? Christ used his wife to get him where he was to be so that he could be delivered, so that he could be delivered unto Christ for salvation. You know what? If you're here today and you haven't been baptized, why? You know, that's not an option. You know, he didn't, I, for a long time, remember, you, you were like, I don't, this isn't for me. I believe, what did you used to say? I believe, but not, not really. And look, look at what he's done. I'm so happy for you, man. Let's. I do believe that just putting God first before everyone, your wife, everybody else, that's the, that's the number one thing. I think putting God first for everything has brought me here today. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, I don't know um, if everybody knows who I am. My name is Sonia. I've been coming here for, I want to say, a little over a year. I actually grew up in a Christian home and got baptized when I was 12 years old, but I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't understand what it meant to follow God. Um, it was always by rules. I strived to be like everyone else because I didn't like the feeling of being different. I wanted to be accepted by everyone and anyone. I realized I had fallen into a pit and I felt as though I couldn't breathe. I cried out to God one night with anger towards him and myself. I cried out asking him, why have you forgotten me? I had been looking for love in the wrong places or things. I asked God that night to forgive me for my many sins. After visiting numerous churches, 
I stumbled on New Life. Literally stumbled. Like, I thought I had put another church, and I didn't. <laughs> Thanks to Google's map. <laughs> I slowly started understanding and realizing what it truly meant to have a relationship with God. It hasn't been easy, and I know I still have a long way to go. But now I see myself trusting and having faith that no matter through the good or the bad, God is there and he has a plan better than mine. Today, I choose to be baptized because I know what it means now. I am living my old, leaving my old me and surrendering all of myself and life to God now and every day. Two Bible verses that I read to myself every morning before I go to work. Romans 5, 3 through 5. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope doesn't put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Also, Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. There were times where I couldn't, I couldn't see how God would want me back. And like Pastor even said, it, it was easier to be bad than try to be good. And I'm very grateful to have met everybody here and Arlene guiding me through the Blue Book. I just have to say that this church has really changed my life. And I know it's God working through you guys. So God bless you all.
whether he knows it or not. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to praise God for everything because you know what? He keeps telling his gospel forever. And you know what? Long after we're gone, he's going to keep telling it and it's going to keep saving. And it's one day it's going to save everything and everyone and it's going to change everything and everyone. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess. That's the way it's going to work. So let's join hands because that's what we do, right? Let's join hands. Let's cross the aisles. Let's remember that we do not belong to ourselves. We are not here for ourselves. It's for not our purposes. It's now for Christ. We have been called out. We are saints, the separated ones, chosen by God, beloved by God. Let's remember what those words were. I needed rescue. My sins were heavy. But you've been saved now by the weight of your glory. Lord God, you're an amazing God. You're an amazing God. Lord God, my words are, are, are disappearing today. My mind's all cluttered. It's crazy. But you know what? It doesn't matter. None of that matters. You know what only matters? You. Lord God, you can speak to even the deaf. Lord God, there's no ear that can't hear you. You can use everything. You can use the wind. You can use the trees. You can use ducks, birds, animals to preach your gospel. You don't need us, but you choose to use us choose to use us Lord God would we remember that would we be overwhelmed by that truth 
that we were made in your image. We were lost and we were far away, but you came to save us. You were the one who came into the garden. Where are you? Why are you hiding? What have you done? Come to me and I'll clothe you. Lord God, help us to preach that truth far and wide, wherever we're at. Help us to live out that truth in our homes. Help us to love with a, a, a modicum of the love that you have for us. Help us to love our wives. Help us as wives to love our husbands. Help us to love our parents. Help us to love our children. Not with the love that expects, but a love that wants to give. Lord God, could you please exalt yourself? Could you please show the world that whatever they're chasing, unless it's you, it's pointless. We exalt you, we praise you, and we live in the rest of your glory. And all the saints said with one voice, amen. You guys have a great day, man.